So, uh, so I'm delighted to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Thank you for being here. Uh, I think based on the revolutions that Sandy mentioned, uh, and because of advances in the technology industry, uh, mathematics, computation, I think it's safe to say, and it's not uh, hyperbole, that we sit at a moment in time in mankind's history where we have the opportunity to understand human disease and biology at a depth that we've never been able to before. And it's, the, it's our premise that it's that understanding that's going to lead to more rational design of therapies in the future compared to what we've been doing in the past, which has worked on occasions. But we've been, in science and medicine, we've been trying to develop therapies for a variety of diseases, uh, but without full knowledge of what is actually going wrong in the setting of human disease. We didn't have access to human cells before. We couldn't manipulate the genome of human cells before, and we didn't even know what mutations were causing disease until recently. But we can do all those things now. And that's why we, we, this is really a moment in time where I think over the next 10 to 20 years, we will see advances in medicine that far outpace the advances we've had over the last 10 to 20 years, which have been significant, but relatively incremental. And I think at the, at the core a lot of a lot of this ability to understand human disease is to finally be able to understand a human cell in a way that we couldn't before. And what we've been able to do in understanding a cell and how it goes right and how it goes wrong has largely been informed through the study of stem cells. And that will be the subject of uh, today's discussions. And so why do I say that? Uh, the reason is that a stem cell can turn into any different cell type in the body. And so if you understand how that happens, then you understand how a cell is being controlled. And the, the discovery that Sandy mentioned that Shinya Yamanaka made, which was essentially that we could take an adult cell that already knew what it was and reprogram that and change it so fundamentally that it would now behave just like an embryonic stem cell that could again become all the different cell types of your body, fundamentally changed how we thought about cells in our body and how we could manipulate those because it taught us that in fact, if you knew enough about that cell, you could control it almost at will and make it do what you want it to do. And if you understand that, then you might understand how a disease could hijack a cell and make it a disease cell. And if you knew that, boy, then you know how to take it back, right? So it's the fundamental aspect of all of this is understanding how a cell decides what it's gonna be and how it will respond to various stresses that might be imposed either by a genetic mutation that causes disease or by environmental influences that we're always getting that then result in disease. So uh, with that backdrop, let me, before we talk about stem cells, let me make sure we're all on the same page about what that means. So a true stem cell in your body has the property that it can become any different cell type that's present in you. That's one property, there, and there's only a, a second property, there's no more. The second property is that it can divide indefinitely, so it can make more and more of itself forever. That's it. That's an embryonic stem cell, which is a true stem cell, has those two properties. There are adult stem cells in all of our bodies that are also very important, they, that help replenish cells within one organ. And those are stem cells, but they can't turn into all cell types in the body, but they can keep rejuvenating an organ. And there are many organs in your body that do have that rejuvenation over time. Uh, and the blood is the most famous of those. And blood stem cells are, are the ones that are used for uh, bone marrow transplants. So we've been doing that for a long time, and it's very successful. For most other organs in your body, though, you can't really take those out, grow them, and put them back in. And so we've had limited success with adult stem cells in other parts of the body. Now, Sandy mentioned that there are types of treatments that some are doing, even in this country, but a lot more around the world, that haven't been validated. And I thought I'd mention that because 
There are a lot of stem cell treatments that you'll read about, and many of you in the audience have asked me about for yourselves, uh, that uh, you look online and people are saying that this can cure virtually every ailment under the sun. Unfortunately, most of those uh, have not been validated. There's probably not a lot of great science behind that, and it's premature. And so what we're trying to do here is to uh, take this step by step in a logical scientific fashion and understand these cells carefully uh, and then utilize that knowledge to, to address disease. And it's still early, but it's happening. So if I've told you that a stem cell, an embryonic stem cell in particular, can become all the different cell types in your body, yet the DNA code is exactly the same in every cell, how does that happen? It turns out that we have a fairly deep understanding of that now, and essentially, the DNA is the same in every cell, so you can think of that as the hardware, but the way that DNA is read, imagine that as a software, it being that what genes a cell decides to turn on and what genes it decides to turn off and have inactive uh, is really the key. So in, you may have 20,000 genes in each cell, so the DNA encodes for genes that encode for protein. If each cell has about 20,000 in any given cell in your body, say a heart cell or brain cell, only a subset is active, maybe 5,000. That means 20,000 genes are silenced. That essentially is the key. If you can control which 5,000 are on at any given time and which 20,000 are off, you can change the fate of a cell by just flipping all those switches and alter what it is. The same thing happens in disease. Different genes get turned on and off that should not be turned on and off. If you can figure that out and flip those switches back to normal, you can stop disease in its tracks. And so we are beginning to understand that all through the study of stem cells. And now we finally have the opportunity to, I think, get at the core of human disease. And that's what we're doing, particularly here at Gladstone. So, and... An iPS cell, you all have heard about these induced pluripotent stem cells that uh, uh, Shinya's lab discovered years ago. That technology can be used in multiple different ways. So let me just summarize those briefly. The first is to use those cells to finally have in front of us human cells that have disease or have a disease mutation. And we at Gladstone are doing that for a variety of heart diseases, brain diseases, and others, and now we can generate billions of human cells, interrogate those in a way we never could before, and then find out what's gone wrong, and then screen for drugs that could correct that. That is happening right now here and across the world, and in fact, we're at the point now, the field has evolved, where we've not only understood the mechanism of disease using human cells, we have screened for drugs, we have candidate drugs in our testing, in various animal models, and that's going to lead to those clinical trials with those. So we're really getting close to now many of these being in clinical trials that have been discovered with iPS cells. That's one approach that's happening. The second is taking these cells, turning them into what cell has been lost in your body that's causing your disease, and then now trying to transplant those cells back into the patient to treat that disease. So that too has advanced, and last year, the first patients were treated with an iPS-derived cell that was transplanted back into the patient. It was identical to that patient, because we, you can take a cell from the adult, transform it, transplant it back. There's no issue of rejection. That has happened for macular degeneration, an eye disease that causes blindness, and that patient is a year out now and is doing well and uh, is, is being monitored for improvements. It was a safety trial, obviously, but there's some signs that there may even be some improvement, and those trials are now going to continue. Now, there are many other areas that that'll happen in the coming years, including Parkinson's, diabetes, and other areas, and, those are all, and spinal cord injury, and those are all following. Now, the third area is uh, a different one, and that is one where, as I mentioned, we can modify cells, we can engineer cells because we understand them well enough. So here, the area that's really at the forefront is 
uh, related to your T cells. So T cells are part of your immune system. What we can do now is make your iPS cells, turn them into T cells that are part of your immune system, manipulate those, modify those, so that those cells now can recognize bad things in your body. We put them back in you, and they can go and attack those. The most famous of those is in the cancer field, where people have been able to manipulate those T cells so that they can recognize cancer cells in your body that have otherwise been under the radar. Cancer cells are very smart. They create this almost shield around them so that your immune system can't see them. That's why they can grow in you. Otherwise, your immune system would kick them out. So what we've done here is we've taken, made your T cells, engineered them so the cancer cells are no longer invisible. They're recognized by your T cells. We put them back in you, and they go and find the cancer cells in your body and kill them. It's, it's a revolution that's going on in the cancer field right now. We think that that same approach can be utilized not just to fight cancer, but to do a number of other things uh, to attack disease where your immune system could go in and do the right things in controlling inflammation uh, or uh, affecting a tissue uh, by uh, altering autoimmune diseases and things like that. And you'll hear more, more from Lee Gann in a moment, both about the use of transplant approaches and uh, immune approaches to try to tackle uh, neurological disorders. So I want to turn now for, uh, for a moment to this notion that you can control cells to be what you want them to be. I've told you that we can take your cells and turn them into a stem cell that then we can then redirect into, say, a heart, brain, pancreas cell, etc. But what if we knew enough so that we didn't even have to take this circuitous route and take your cell and make it a stem cell and then, say, a heart cell, but rather we could go directly from your cell that you already have in the, as an adult and directly turn it into a heart cell or a brain cell or a liver cell without it ever even becoming a stem cell. So now we can do that. We have found uh, ways here at Gladstone, we've, I think we've been the pioneers in this area, which we, we, we often refer to as direct reprogramming because it goes directly from one cell type to another. We can turn cells in your body directly into heart cells, brain cells, liver cells, pancreatic cells, just by knowing which switches to flip and what cues to give without them ever becoming a stem cell. So the reason that's powerful is that in some, in, for some organs, there are a number of cells in the organ that you could harness for regenerating that damaged organ. So let me explain this. The heart, for example, is you think of it as a beating muscle, right? There are beating cells in the heart that make it pump. It turns out that only half the cells in your heart are muscle. The other half in your heart are just support cells for that muscle. They form the architecture of a scaffold. And they're there, they're important, but they're not muscle. They're never going to be muscle. So when somebody has a heart attack, your muscle cells die. Those support cells actually go to form the scar so your heart doesn't explode open, and you kind of heal that with scar tissue. Well, what if you could convert those cells that are already in the organ? They're there already. Give them the right cues so now they became beating heart muscle. You could regenerate the organ from within with its, your own cells. So that's what we've been able to do over the last few years uh, by sending just a few key cues into the heart after damage. We can convert those support cells into new beating muscle that integrates with the other muscle cells in the heart and beat in synchrony and actually can increase the amount of blood pumped from the heart. We've done this in mouse, and then we've advanced this. We can do it in human cells in a dish, and most recently we've been able to do it in large animals, particularly pigs, whose hearts are more similar to ours in size. Um, and there we also we can improve the heart function. So that technology has advanced pretty far. It's not quite ready for a clinical trial yet, but the path is clear. And so we've recently 
licensed that out into a startup company, a spin-out company from Gladstone, which we've called Tanaya Therapeutics. And that entity, biotech company, will now take that and develop it so they can be tested in a clinical trial. We think that approach is not unique to the heart. We should be able to do that for the number of other organs that I mentioned because it's really just knowing the cues that are telling that cell what to be. So it's, we think it'll be a broadly applicable approach for a variety of diseases where you've lost cells, you just need to get new ones. Now, I'll close with what we've done most recently here at Gladstone, which is another alternative approach to switching a cell's fate, but also gets to the stem of being able to control what a cell is doing. So many organs in your body, once you become a few weeks after birth, the cells that you have in that organ is what you got. And that's why if you have a heart attack or if you have a stroke, then if you lose cells, you don't really get that many cells back because those organs don't have great uh, adult stem cells in them to replenish itself. But typically, you don't lose all your cells. There's some cells left whether you have a heart attack or a stroke. So what if you could get the cells that are left and are good to just make more of themselves? Meaning, can you get them to divide and replicate and create more of themselves? That would unleash the potential for you to regenerate again from within. And so we've worked really hard the last few years to find a way to unlock the ability of a cell to divide because after all, when we were all embryos, all our cells were dividing all the time. That's how we grew. That's how we went from, you know, that big to this big. So all we have to do is figure out how nature does that in an embryo and redeploy that again in the adult, and maybe we could make that happen. So just in the last year, we've actually been able to do that. We've found the right cocktail of factors that can tell an adult cell to go back in time and be more like an embryo and divide again. We've applied that to the heart, where we've been able to regenerate heart muscle. So far, just in mice, now we're going to advance that into uh, to larger animals. But we can, we can create a lot of more new muscle by doing this. We've tested it so far in brain cells. Uh, we think we're close. It does it pretty well there, but we've got a few more steps to, that we think we're missing. We've tested it in the ear. Why the ear? So uh, when people lose their hearing, there are neurons in the ear that are actually sensing vibrations. And typically in hearing loss, those are the ones that are lost and you don't get any more. I have a personal uh, uh, reason for the, doing testing this. Uh, even though I'm a cardiologist, I have twins who are 15 years old and they both have hearing loss in both ears. They wear hearing aids, they do fine. But it sure would be nice if we could get them some more of these neurons so they didn't have to wear those. Uh, so we've tested that and uh, we think we're very close there also to be, being able to get those cells to divide. And we're testing a variety of cells in the body, but again, we think this will be a broadly applicable approach to multiple different cells in your body to try to regenerate more. And so what all this, I think, uh, really starts from is, from is having a very fundamental and basic understanding of how a cell works. Because if you can figure that out, then you can manipulate the system in order to fix the problems. And if you don't understand that, you're just shooting darts. And so at Gladstone, our approach is basic science, and it's really getting at the core of how cells normally and in disease works. And it's our belief that, and I think we're demonstrating it, that that is the key to being able to address human disease. And I've given you a couple of examples of those, and there are many, many others, uh, great science going on in the institution, but it all starts from there, a basic understanding of the cell. So with that, I'm going to stop and uh, introduce uh, Lee Gann, who's going to give you some examples of some of these approaches, specifically in the brain around uh, Alzheimer's disease. Lee? Lee? 